Unfortunately, Matt couldn't be here to, to, with us today, so he'll be joining us online. But still, he has a lot of interesting things to say, so give him a warm welcome as if he were here and enjoy the talk. Hello. I hope people can hear me. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Meta Tamal. I am a developer advocate at Google. Uh, I'm based in London. And first of all, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Um, I actually been to Belgrade uh, back in 2017, I think, for this conference. Um, and then I came last year during the pandemic because um, we had a really hard lockdown in London. But um, Belgrade was quite open and I spent quite a bit of time there. So I really enjoyed the city and I was excited to be to get there again. But I couldn't because of some uh, work travel policy. But anyway, I'm glad at least I'm here online with you. Um, I want to talk to you about choreography versus orchestration in serverless microservices. That was the name of my title, but I put serverless micro into parentheses because everything I'm going to talk about, it actually applies to any kind of service. They don't have to be serverless. They don't have to be micro. Uh, it's mostly about service orchestration. So, so that's why I put that in parentheses. Uh, if you want to follow these kind of topics, this is my Twitter handle. Uh, feel free to follow me. And also the slides and different uh, variations of these slides, um, they're already on speaker deck, so feel free to grab them from there. All right. So first of all, uh, what do I mean by choreography and orchestration? And what I'm trying to answer in this talk is basically this question. How do you organize a group of services to cooperate towards a common goal, right? You know, back in the day, we used to have these monolithic applications where everything was kind of bundled together and deployed together. Then we went through this phase of um, breaking the monolith into smaller microservices. So instead of one gigantic monolithic application, you started we started having, you know, a lot of different microservices that do smaller things. But then we ended up with different problems. We ended up with the problem of how do you coordinate these microservices? how they communicate with each other, how they orchestrate them, things like that. So that's what I am trying to answer here. Now, let's imagine we have this e-commerce application where we receive some orders from users and we want to ship some items, right? And, you know, I'm simplifying here, but let's say you have some microservices to deal with this. So maybe you have a front end to receive the orders, then you have a payment processor uh, service that processes the payments. And if a pay payment, payment is okay, then maybe you have a shipping function that you know does all the work needed for shipping the items to the user. And finally, you probably want to notify the user, so maybe you have a notification kind of service. And I'm sure there's more services in, in an e-commerce application, but let's just keep it simple here. And if you want to get these microservices um, kind of cooperate, one easy way of doing that is um, let them call each other directly. So the front end knows that there's a payment processor and calls th that directly. When the payment processor is finished, it knows that there's a shipper and it will call it directly, right? So this is direct service to service calls. Uh, and when you look at this approach, uh, there's pros and cons. The pros is that this is very easy to implement. You know, so you have services that simply call each other. So it's a very simple architecture. It's very simple to reason. It's very simple to implement. On the other hand, you are creating coupling between your services. So every time you change a service, you know, in, in the middle of the chain, you need to think about who's calling my service because that might have implications for that service or who my service calls to, right? So this coupling, um, it's not great because every time you need to change, you need to kind of figure figure out like your dependencies and your the things that you call. Each service can be a single point of failure because if a service fails in the middle, the whole chain kind of breaks and that's not great. Each service needs its own uh, error retime and timeout logic, right? So if something fails, you probably want to retry before giving up. Um, or if there's some kind of error, you want to probably handle that, right? You can't just, you know, let errors flow like that. Uh, but this logic, that's not really business logic. It's more about resiliency. You need to implement that somewhere, you know, and then you need to do that for each service. And also there's nothing ensuring that the whole transaction is successful because in this simple chain, every service can do their bit, 
but there's nothing watching the chain and making sure that the whole transaction that spans multiple microservices uh, is actually successful. And there's something called Saga pattern that might help you here that maybe we'll have time to talk about later. All right, so, so the direct service to service communication um, is simple, but it already has a lot of problems. So another option that you can do is you can use uh, events uh, and indirect communication. And this is also known as choreography. Now in this model, um, you still have your microservices independently deployed, but instead of services calling each other directly, you they communicate indirectly using events. So you have a message broker or message bus or whatever you want to call it. So something that kind of routes messages. Uh, you receive the orders in the front end, then the front end, when it's finished its part, it will say, okay, I received this order and it will send this order received uh, request. And then this message will go to the broker. The broker will figure out that the payment processor is the one that's interested in this message type. The payment processor will receive that message and it will do its payment processing and it will emit another event type, payment processed, so on and so forth. Now, what does, it, what does that, this do for us? Um, and by the way, uh, if you look at different cloud providers like Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure, there's all, ser all sorts of services that help for this event-driven architectures, you know, like Event Arc, Event Bridge, Event Grid, they're all, you know, slightly different products with different names, but they all try to do the same thing. And also there's open source projects like Kafka and, and RabbitMQ and others that can help. So if you want to build an event-driven system, you have the building blocks already. Now, what is the pros and cons of, of this approach? First of all, in this approach, services are loosely coupled. They don't know about each other. They don't care about each other. So this allows them to change independently without really caring about what other services are doing, really. Secondly, um, yeah, I mentioned this already, services can be changed and scaled independently. I mean, they're just communicating via events, so they don't. you don't need to stop anything or we don't need to think too much about other services. There is no single point of failure. So if a service in the middle um, kind of stops working, um, the rest of the services, they can still send messages and receive messages. Um, and then maybe the queue of that service that's down might be backing up with more messages, but at least the rest of the, the services can still function. And events are very useful if you want to extend your architecture. So if you want to add a new kind of service, for example, uh, all you need to do is deploy the service, configure what kind of messages that service needs to get, and then that's it. You know, you don't need to change anything with the rest of your architecture. So it makes it really easy to extend your, your architecture. On the other hand, event-driven systems, they tend to be difficult to monitor. Uh, this is because you have all sorts of events and all sorts of um, event types flying around. And if something goes wrong in, in your architecture, you don't know immediately what failed. So you need to kind of figure out, okay, I sent this message. So that message was sent, but then it was received here, but it wasn't processed. Then you need to look at that services queue and then maybe the logs and figure out why it wasn't processed. So it's not immediately obvious when something fails. Errors, retries, and timeouts that I talked about before, they're still hard to do and you need to kind of implement them so they don't go away. Um, the flow of your application is not captured anywhere. like you know, in event-driven systems, in, in, in event-driven systems, the flow is almost like um, a byproduct of your, of your architecture. So there's no single place you can go and look for the, how the flow should be. And this problem of who ensures that the whole transaction is successful, uh, it's still a problem, right? Uh, you know, there's the, maybe if services are doing their work, but again, the transaction might not be successful yet, or maybe a service is falling behind and we need to wait for that, right? So we need to still think about this. All right, um, and also imagine a more complex scenario where you need to read the database, check the stock, and depending on the stock, see if you need to order some uh, supplies from a supplier API using third-party API, then update your DB again, then use third-party SendGrid to send notifications. So this is a more real-world kind of uh, flow, which is easy to understand because when you look at this, you know what should happen. But when you take this 
and convert to event-driven kind of architecture, you will not only lose this flowchart, but it also becomes quite difficult to figure out like what's happening in your system. Okay, so what can you do then? Um, and now we can look at another approach, uh, which is a central orchestrator. And in this approach, um, again, you have your services uh, deployed independently. It's important to have them as small microservices, but you also have a, an orchestrator, an external service, whose job is to kind of direct the calls to different services. So in this orchestrator, you define how the calls should happen. So you, you define the rules of, you know, when I receive a request, um, you know, the, the, the front end will kick off the orchestration. Orchestration will have a set of rules that says, call the payment processor, um, get and get the result, and then call the shipper with the result from payment processor and get the result and so on and so forth. So orchestrator is the one kind of directing the calls to your services. Again, if you look at Google Cloud, there's workflows for this that I'm going to talk about um, next. There is a step functions on AWS. Uh, Azure has uh, durable functions, I think, and, and Logic Apps as well. And there's also open source uh, projects coming up in this space, um, CNCF serverless workflow. Uh, and also long time um, business orchestration tools like Camel and Camunda that can help here. Okay, uh, so what do we get with an orchestrator? Well, first of all, I think the main benefit of an orchestrator is that the business flow that I showed you before, the, that flow chart, you can take that and you can convert it into an orchestration. Um, so with that, um, you get a central place where you define your work workflow. You can source control that workflow. You can version that workflow. Um, so it, that this has a lot of benefits, basically. You know, that there's this central place where you can kind of keep track of your uh, orchestrations. Now, in orchestrations, you have this notion of steps. So, you know, there's things that happen in, in steps. And if something goes wrong, you see immediately that something fell in this step. And then what you can do is that you can go to that step, look what the orchestration is doing in that step. Oh, it's calling this service. And then you can go to that service directly. So it makes it much easier to monitor your system and figure out what's happening if something goes wrong. The errors, retries, and timeouts, they can, you still need to implement them, but now you can centralize them. So you can implement these policies in your orchestration, and the orchestration is the one that can apply these policies. That way your microservices can stay simple. You know, they can only do, they can basically do the business logic, and then your orchestrator can take care of these errors, retries, and timeouts. And your services are still independent. That's the key point. They are still independent, but you're kind of bringing them together into this central uh, orchestration for what you need to do. Now, on the other hand, uh, a new orchestration service is something you need to learn and maintain as, as in every new service that you want to introduce to your architecture. Uh, orchestrator can be a single point of failure because you know it's the one directing the calls. So if it goes down, then you know there won't be any calls. So you need to make sure that you're using a resilient and redundant orchestrator. Um, you lose a little bit of flexibility with orchestrators in the sense that if you need to change your architecture, you need to deploy a new service, and then you need to um, change your orchestration to use that service and deploy your orchestration as well. So that makes it a little bit more um, difficult to update your architecture. And now, um, in terms of failed services, now it's easier to see the failures. So if, if a service fails, you see which step um, fails, but then you need to think about how am I going to handle this um, failure, right? So you still need to implement those failures. And there's again the, a pattern called Saga pattern that helps you to, you know, uh, basically compensate for a failure. So if, if a service fails, you see it in the step, and then you take a compensation step to undo what you did before you call that service. And I don't know if you're going to have time, but I'll talk about this later if we have time. All right, so at this point, you might be wondering, you know, drive calls, event-driven services, orchestration, which one should I use? Uh, and, you know, in software engineering, this is the typical answer, right? Like, it's, it depends, really. Uh, it depends what you're trying to do, how much time you have, how much resilience you need. Uh, but just to recap uh, at the high level, 
you know, if you have a simple architecture with a handful of services that don't change that often, so they always call each other in the same order, maybe it's okay to do direct calls. You know, we know that direct calls uh, cause coupling that you need to think about. But, you know, if the coupling is just one service calling another service, then maybe changing this service is not is not so difficult to say, okay, I need to think about this service as well. So it's not ideal, but at the same time, why take the complexity if you don't need it? On the other hand, if your services are not closely related, they don't need to know about each other, um, services are um, e executed, you know, in not a certain order, they can, ex they can execute in, in any order, and they can also exist in different kind of contexts. So you want to be able to plug them in into different places, then that's when event driven kind of makes sense because you want basically flexibility in your architecture and event driven gives you that flexibility. But at the same time, um, if your services, they are close related, they are usually deployed in a certain order, they're usually called in a certain order. Um, and then you have this architecture that you can describe in a flowchart and you want to kind of maintain that flowchart and, and not lose that information, then maybe orchestrator makes sense as well. But then you need to kind of um, define these rules and implement these rules in the orchestrator and deploy the orchestrator. So there's a lot of, little bit of more work involved there. But these are the things that I kind of think about uh, when I, whenever I'm building my architecture and make sure that I'm choosing the right kind of flavor. And you can also combine these things as well. You don't have to choose one or the other. So you can have an orchestration that gets triggered by an event, or you have an, you can have an orchestration that can, at the end of the orchestration, you can send an event to another orchestration. So you can mix and match as well, but it's good to think about them. I guess that's my point. Think about these beforehand so that you make a conscious choice on pros and cons. All right, so now let's talk through some orchestration topics uh, in more detail. Um, so as I mentioned, there's an open source project called CNCF Serverless Workflow that tries to give you these tools to do service orchestrations. So this CNCF Service Workflow, it's a specification on defining these workflows. Uh, and SDK and runtimes and tooling around it, basically. So it's something to look for uh, if you're thinking about using orchestration and if you want to stay in open source, definitely check this out. Me, on the other hand, uh, since I work for Google Cloud, I played with workflows the most. So that's what I know. And and what I want to, and now I want to show you some workflows so that you can get some idea on how it works. So that if you if you want to use an orchestration, you can kind of have an idea on what to expect. Um, so workflows, it's a service to orchestrate and integrate different services. And it allows you to orchestrate uh, Google Cloud code, uh, your code running in Google Cloud. Google APIs, so if you want to call like a Gmail API or, or any other Google Cloud APIs, you can include that in your orchestration. And you can even call external APIs. So if you want to use SendGrid or Twilio or something like that, you can bring those into your orchestrations. And actually, let me show you a real quick example of how this works. So let's say we want to implement that service chain that I show you, you know, with, with service A calling service B, service B calling service C. How can you do that in an orchestration? And this is, by the way, on GitHub. Um, and here I'm showing some simple services uh, just to go through them really quickly. Um, I deployed a cloud function, which is a function that generates a random number. Um, so I, I deployed it like this on Google Cloud. Then I deployed another function called multiply that takes a number and multiplies with another number. So it's a multipl multiplication function. Then I have um, an external function, math.js, that's external to Google Cloud. And I'm using the log expression from that um, from the math.js. So it takes a number and returns a log of that number. So it's an external function. And finally, I have this Cloud Run service, which is a container service on Google Cloud. Uh, it's a floor function, floor service that takes a number and then returns the floor of that number. So if you have a number like 6.86, it will return six. So as you see here, I have two functions, one external service and one container service. So they are different kinds of services. And what I want to do is I want to chain them together into an orchestration. So how do you chain them? Uh, you create a YAML or JSON in workflow. So here I have a workflow YAML. And in, in here, you define the steps for workflow to do. 
And these steps, you can call them whatever you want. But here I call this first step random gen function. And I'm making an HTTP get call to this URL, which is the URL of my cloud function. So workflow will make this call for us and it will return the result and save it to this random gen result variable. Next, I define my next step, multiply function. Same thing, it will call the function multiply function, but the input is the result from the previous uh, step. So that's how I get the previous result and look at the body and the random variable. And then do, I keep the result in multiply result. Then we call the log, uh, we, we have a log function where we call the uh, log uh, function from math.js.org. So you see, we are calling the URL with HTTP get again, and the, this time it's a query parameter, and we, pa we pass in log and the result from the previous step. And then finally, we call the Flare, Flare um, service, which is a container service that's, that's also private. It's not a public service, so I'm passing this authentication token. Uh, and I'll, I'm also passing the log result from the previous result. And then, you know, uh, workflow will make this call and capture the result in flow result. And finally, the orchestration returns the result from the last step, right? So that's how you define it. And then you can go to Google Cloud and I have, I should have it here under workflows. And then if I do service chaining, so it's here. And what you get is, you know, you can look at the source. So this is the source that I show you. You get a nice visualization showing how things should flow, which is very useful. And then you can uh, execute it. So if you have an input, you can pro provide it here, but we don't have an input in this case. I hit execute and now it's running. So it's called multiply function, it's called the floor function. And then finally, when it's finished, it will return the result. And the result is not that exciting. It's just a number uh, and the HTTP code. But basically, this told, told me that the whole orchestration uh, worked and it returned me the result. So that's that's um, workflow in a nutshell. And um, so now some of these slides I can probably skip, but basically you define the steps and you define what happens in those steps and workflow kind of executes those for you on your behalf. Um, you can do things like pausing. So let's say you call the payment processor and the shipper, and you want to pause some time before calling notifier. You can do that in workflow really easily. You can pass in variables, uh, sorry, you can pass in JSON uh, between steps. And also when you get a result back, you can parse that JSON. Uh, so you have that simple parsing in workflow definition. Um, if you want to apply errors and retries, um, you can do that as part, like around your steps. So basically you can say, I want to call the payment processor, but I want to apply this retry policy that's five times an exponential back off policy. So you can do, the, do that um, policy as part of your call. So in the step, you will basically apply the policy uh, as a retry policy. And then you can also say, you know, I call this shipper function. If I re receive this status code, HTTP, HTTP code or whatever, like, you know, um, whatever HTTP code is success for you, then I will call this next step called notifier. But then if I receive HTTP 500 something, then I will route that to this other step where we, I will call this pager service to let people know. So these errors and retries, you can basically handle in the orchestration instead of um, your, um, your code. And this conditional um, checking, like checking if something is in stock or out of stock, usually this do, you do this kind of stuff in your code, but you can also do it in, in the orchestration definition. And that helps you to kind of uh, centralize these decisions and also not do everything in the code, but instead just do it kind of externally. And other useful features are that um, you have sub workflows to kind of create reusable workflows and call them from different workflows. There's connectors to connect to other Google Cloud services um, so that you, you know, it, it makes it very easy basically to call other services and do uh, retries and, and waiting for calls, especially if the call is a long running call, you can wait for that. And there's more features like iterations. You can do for loops. Like for example, you can call Twitter with workflow, get the results, let's say 100 results, 100 tweets, and then you can iterate on them using a for loop. Uh, 
or you can wait for human input to your workflow using callback. So there's a lot of stuff here that I'm just going through really fast so that you have an idea on what it provides. Um, and deploying, executing a workflow, you can do, do it from command line or you can do it from the, from the UI that, as I showed you. And the UI gives you this really nice visualization on uh, what should happen in your system, which I find really useful uh, when I'm debugging something or when I'm trying to visualize what should happen. All right, so that was a really quick introduction to workflows and orchestration. Um, I am almost out of time, but I have these slides that I want to just point them to you so that you can check them out on your own if you want. Um, and in these slides, I basically explain what are some of the patterns and best practices we've seen in orchestration. And one thing is, I mentioned this before, we see event-driven orchestrations. So you, we orchestrate what we need, um, but then we let the trigger with an event. And I have an example on GitHub for this. Um, that's a very useful pattern that I see all, over and over. Um, when you need to handle errors, you can apply retry policies in your workflow. And then when something is successful, you go through the regular path. But if something is not successful, say you try to reserve a credit, but there's a failure, then you need to take a compensation step. So in this case, the compensation step is rejecting the order. So first you create the order, but then you, then you need to reject the order. Uh, so doing this is what Saga pattern is, you know, follow the happy path if you can, but if not, if there's a failure, take a compensation step. And this is very easy to do in workflows. Uh, and I show you th that in, in this example on GitHub. And there's this um, pattern where your workflow runs and then at some point waits for an input. This could be an input from a, uh, a user uh, via HTTP, or it could be an input from some event, like someone sending a message or someone uh, saving a file. So this pattern of waiting for something to happen, uh, it's a very useful pattern. And I have a few examples of this on GitHub as well that you can check out. Um, you should parallelize what you can in orchestrations because you know I show you in workflow that everything's a step. Like, you know, you call step A, step B, step C, but it doesn't have to be that way. If your steps are independent, then you can do, you can say something like, you know, um, call these three steps in parallel. And once, once they're done, give me the result. And I show an example of this by, by calling a BigQuery job where you run jobs. If you run them sequentially, five, five jobs that each take 20 seconds, it takes hundred seconds, but then by just telling workflow to run them in parallel because they're independent, you can cut that down to basically one query of 20 seconds. So make sure you parallelize when you can. And last but not least, all of this stuff that I show you is serverless in the sense that your, your um, services are serverless, your orchestration from workflows is serverless. So you don't need to worry about machines, which is great for developers where we don't need, we don't like to maintain machines and all that. But sometimes you need to use machines. You need to use virtual machines uh, because you need some kind of, um, maybe you're running into some limitations of the serverless framework. Uh, maybe you need more CPU, maybe you need GPU, you, maybe you need some kind of special configuration. So for those who use cases where you need a virtual machine, you can actually use workflow to manage that virtual machine. And I have this example uh, that you can check out where I show you how to run um, a long running container to generate prime numbers um, uh, and how you to use workflow to create a virtual machine, uh, run the workload, make sure the workload is finished, get the result and delete the virtual machine. That way you're using servers. Uh, so it's server full, but you're using workflow to manage that, which makes it almost like serverless because as a user, you don't see that, see that server and you don't care about that server. And uh, similarly, there are things like long running batch jobs. Um, that is something called cloud run job on Google Cloud where you run containers, um, long running containers. Again, you, use, you, you can use workflows to manage that. Uh, and that's, a, that's another useful pattern that you can have. So the, the cloud run job runs the job, but you use workflow to manage the creation of those jobs, parallelizing those jobs, stuff like that. The management of it uh, can be done by workflows. Uh, okay, and, and lastly, um, 
you, you know, you know, in GitHub, GitOps is to manage your code. So you deploy your code in staging, run tests. If everything works, you merge it and then you deploy to production. Um, you can do the same for your orchestration. And I show you how in this example. And you also should think about how do you, how do you deploy your orchestration to multiple environments? Because um, you can't just have everything in production. You probably need production, staging, and test. And in this example, I show you a couple of different approaches on how to plan for multi-environment multi deployments when you have an orchestration. All right, uh, I'm out of time. So thanks again for having me, even though I wasn't here in person. At least it was good to be here uh, online. If you want to check out more about workflows, this is the link. Uh, we have a GitHub page. Uh, with lots of demos and patterns that you can check out. And yeah, I don't know if we are taking any questions, but if we are, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. So thanks very much for your, your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Matt. You were really missed here, but that was a great talk. So thank you very much. Uh, as for the people who are here, uh, so we're going to take a break before continuing this track. Uh, just a quick reminder, the expo zone there upstairs is open and there's a lot of things to do. Plus, there are ongoing quizzes that will, be, uh, that will have winners announced here on stage at the end of the day. So enjoy. Thank you. <laughs>